right, welcome back. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, we're now joined by Ambassador Abdul Fatal Musa, who is the ECOWAS Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security. He's also former director for West Africa and the Sahel UN headquarters in New York. Good morning and thank you for coming on today. Well, good morning. Yeah. Well, clearly, I mean, many woke up this morning just uh, seeing the, one of the most recent information that uh, after the delegation from ECOWAS recently met with the Junta in the share, uh, where they offered the three-year transition plan. ECOWAS flatly rejected it, as you were quoted severally as well, saying, no, that is unacceptable. So could you give us a little more detail what this is about? Yes. <clears throat> uh, we've had the experience of uh, these cat and mouse games with uh, military regimes. Um, look, let me tell you, you know, one thing. Niger had a new constitution in 2010. It was revised in 2017, barely six years, five years after that. What uh, dramatic change do you need in the, uh, what is it, uh, governance architecture of the country to require three years, you know, and uh, to experiment with something else? This is like subterfuge, right, to uh, throw ECOWAS off course, and then do whatever they want. In some other countries, under military regime in West Africa, they had about three years, and already they are negotiating, negotiating <clears throat> with their population to have another 18 months. Even a democratically elected uh, president in Nigeria has only four years to run. So what legitimacy do they have, you know, to already begin with uh, three years, and we know it is not going to end there. You know, so uh, this offer is completely unacceptable. And uh, Equus insists on the restoration of constitutional order <clears throat> as quickly as possible. And that is our position, you know, because we are no longer going to get into drawn out uh, haggling, you know, with the uh, people who have used their power against their own constitution. You know, so this is the position of ECOWAS. Well, it does appear now, because it was the first time we got a window that indeed that the uh, junta was open to conversation was through one of the emissaries who went from Nigeria, that they were going to be, uh, they were willing to, to, to speak. I think he had uh, listened to some Islamic clerics uh, who had gone from Nigeria. And that was the first time. Well, you can tell us if you had already heard another time when the Jonta did say that they were willing to have a conversation. But we heard that. Uh, but on the back of that, as we heard that, we also heard them saying that they were going to prosecute the former president or the deposed president for high treason. And people were wondering, uh, how can they be saying the same thing, you know, saying two things almost at the same time? Um, what, what, what sort of indication was this given? But tell us, did, is ECOWAS, you know, exploring that window of dialogue with them, uh, you know, and how is that charge, that charge of high treason against uh, President Bazoum, how is it going? Yeah. <clears throat> From the get-go, ECOWAS has always left the door open for negotiations with them, for dialogue to restore constitutional order. First, to free the, the president who is still being kept hostage, Mohamed Bazoum, his family and his uh, members of his cabinet, and to restore constitutional order in the country. That has been on the table all along. They were the one rebuffing all efforts by ECOWAS to contact them. Um, you remember uh, former head of state, Abdul Salam Abu Bakar, when they were the mission and they were confined to the airport, we were going there in a joint mission with the African Union, that's ECOWAS, African Union, and the UN, and they flatly said they were not ready to receive us. What is making them talk? Okay, there are back-channel negotiations ongoing, back-channel negotiations, but it is the pressure that ECOWAS is maintaining that is making them loosen up. Uh, first, the sanctions, and also the threat of the use of force. And ECOWAS has always mentioned that uh, force is the very, very last option. 
Well, if when everything else has failed, and, and we still stand by that, we have always extended the olive leave to them. If they want to take it, it is there. But like I said, ECOWAS is not going to engage in endless haggling over restoration of constitutional order in the country. They have no legality, no legal basis for them to, to hold the people of Niger to ransom and then dictating their own uh, transition timetable, you know, of uh, three years. What are they going to do in those three years? When, after the coup, we have seen an uptick in terrorist attacks in the country. There is unrest. People are in, in suffering. Niger, in Yemen? In, in, in uh, Niger. They, you know, they just killed about 27 soldiers with many more wounded. For months, Niger never experienced that. We've seen the Tuareg trying to mobilize against this, you know, regime inside the country. And this is a country that had resolved the issue of diversity, where the Tuareg were incorporated in the governance process, so you never saw them rising up against the state like we've seen in Mali, for example. And you are throwing all that away for very selfish reasons. You know, I mean, taking opportunity of the fact that you are the presidential guard, tasked with the... Uh, with uh, protecting the president and then capturing him, keeping him hostage. And then after that, you then start mo uh, finding justification, including these charges of high treason. Mm. I mean, w w when did they discover the high treason? While he was in detention? So are you telling us that even though they are now given this three-year window within which they say they will return uh, to constitutional authority, um, this has not been achieved through, even this uh, pronunciation of theirs has not been done through negotiation. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. It, it, it has never, you know, gone to any negotiation. Mm -hmm. This is their unilateral decision. Has there, been any has there been any conversation at all with ECOWAS? No, we've just had the opening salvos with them. Okay, that is uh, with the visit of... Uh, uh, former head of state Abdul Salam Abu Bakar and the uh, Emir of Sokoto, who were in the country the on Saturday, the yeah, yeah uh, they were able to meet uh, Lamin Zain, the new prime minister of the Janta, and they were able also to go and then uh, visit the detained president Mohamed Bazoum. Okay, had initial discussion, but this announcement of a three-year transition. You know, also it's like a slap in the face, right? Because it was never discussed. It is a unilateral decision, and Equus is not ready to accept it. Mm -hmm. that, is the, that, that, that is the bottom line here. Yeah. Are you also taking into cognizance? Because, you know, since that time, people have said, oh, Equus, you need to be careful, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, the local politics in Niger uh, and also the circumstances. People have talked about how, you know, the colonizers of France, of uh, Niger, um, you know, have taken deep advantage of countries that they colonize, for instance, Niger and their mineral resources, uranium. Uh, there have been lots of videos made to educate people, uh, and people have been saying that, oh, ECOWAS is actually doing the bidding of Western powers, not exactly its own biddings. I, I do not know whether you, you know, you're looking at this very let's well, say, complex but you know, delicate situation in terms of the role that people think that ECOWAS could be playing vis-a-vis, -vis, according to them, the liberation that people in Niger seek. Yes, we have taken all that into account. Let me be very uh, frank here, right? A French policy in Africa has not been helpful. The assimilation policy. The, the assimilation policy, the control of uh, the uh, economies of the West African countries, and the imposition of the franc CFA, which makes it impossible for local manufacturers, you know, actually to compete with uh, the, the French counterparts in their, in their own countries simply because of the very artificial pegging of uh, the franc CFA to Europe through France. This has happened for a very long time. And if you ask me what ECOWAS has been doing for years now, 
ECOWAS has been working towards introducing a common currency for the region. For example, ECO. And if you remember not long ago, when uh, it came to uh, having very concrete transition toward the ECO, uh, the Mac President Macron came and said that we more countries should be the first to use the ECO because they have already got their macroeconomic convergence criteria in place and then all that. But this echo was mooted by the non cipher block, right? And even the offer of uh, the, 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 what is it, the Francophone country taking over uh, the echo uh, did, not, did not exclude still the remote control by France over the currency. You know, for example. So, of course, ECOWAS flatly rejected it. And, uh, you know, going further, uh, we know that 70% uh, of energy, uh, you know, power in France is uh, derived from uranium, nuclear energy. And uh, Niger pro provides 17% of the uranium needs of France, right? While uh, the majority of the Nigerian people are living in darkness. But that being the case, the leader of this junta has been part and parcel of that system that has facilitated the situation in the country over the years. He has been the presidential guard commander since 2010, promoting all these policies by the government and their linkages with uh, France. So what has changed? If it is not an opportunistic, uh, what is it, uh, uh, approach, you know, to take advantage of uh, people's uh, discontentment with the former colonial power and the other Western powers in order to use their power. That is one, you know, issue. Number two, the situation in Niger, you know, in terms of uh, geopolitics, is not that simple. Today, uh, the U.S. policy there is very different from France. They are both Western countries. You've got, uh, of course, the Russian, the Chinese. You've got the Middle Eastern powers. Also, in that place, a very complex dynamic because of the multipolarity of the world today. You see, so it is not very simple you know, just pointing an accusing figure at uh, one particular power and say that this is why this is happening. If this were the case, it should have been an insurrection in the street. You don't stage a palace school and then move on to start mobilizing people using grievances. Against France. Against France. I mean, that is, that is what we are seeing. So what about and the sentiment that uh, they want... Francophone countries want France to be out of their affairs so that they can really and truly be independent. That is the uh, choice of the people. ECOWAS has no say in that, right? Uh, what they do, you know, to get France, and we've seen uh, uh, what are the colonial pact agreements between France and their former colony being torn apart, being torn up, ripped up, in uh, places like Mali, we've seen it being ripped up in uh, places like Burkina Faso. That is the choice of the people. What the court is concerned about is not that at all. Okay, we can uh, promote something like uh, the autonomy of this country, create the uh, facilitating environment for the countries to, you know, sort of uh, realize their potential because. Our region is very rich in human and natural resources. So there is no justification uh, for us to be where we are today in West Africa. That is a given. What ECOWAS is concerned about is that do it the right way. ECOWAS is a rules-based organization. Niger is signatory to our protocols. The Janta, CNSP, has uh, flouted their own constitution. That is not the way. Okay. You know, to go about it. How has ECOWAS given consideration to those complexities in terms of those nationals, multinationals who have foot on ground? What kind of consideration is ECOWAS giving to that? Yes. Um, see, uh, ECOWAS is running 
a whole number of uh, programs in the region. I can cite you the community development program. I can cite also the implementation of the equal conflict prevention framework. Under those frameworks, one of them is natural resource governance, for example. And it is about equity. It is about the uh, corporate social responsibility you know, issue that ECOWAS has been promoting, but which, uh, you know, to, for one reason or the other, is not adequately known by the people because yeah. it is conflict okay. that usually uh, captures the headlines. Yeah, I actually meant in relation to the possibility of the use of force to get the junta out. So those other national, those countries that are on ground, are yeah. they going to support ECOWAS? Will they be neutral? We've, or we've never discussed our plans with any foreign power. Whether they are on the ground, they are in the air, they are in their countries, ECOWAS is taking an independent, autonomous decision. And then I, I'm just coming from Accra, where the Chiefs of Defense Staff uh, finalized their preparation for a potential military intervention in the country. Foreign support was never part of the consideration at all. The member states said, we are going in with our own equipment, contingent own equipment, in military terms, we are going with our own resources, you know, and we are not asking anybody, anybody for support. That is the position of ECOA. So, uh, uh, listen, some of these powers have issued statements supporting the ECOA position, some condemning the coup, even including Russia. China, all of them have condemned the coup. But do they support the use of force? N not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, uh, we do not care who supports the use of force. What we are saying is that it is one of the tools in our arsenal when it comes to restoring constitutional order. But we have not exhausted uh, the non-cohesive elements of our uh, what is that, a conflict resolution framework in the country. That is why you saw, uh, the, you know, President Abdul Salam Abu Bakr in the country. That is why we are still knocking on the door for the uh, ECOWAS AU to visit the country to still continue to engage. We haven't exhausted that. Sanctions are biting. Sanctions are also midway between uh, the purely peaceful resolution of crisis, and the coercive element. Will, okay. there, will there be more sanctions, if need be? Depends upon the behavior of the junta. Be, be, you, you know, if they continue, uh, uh, you know, with these unilateral actions, without consultations, and uh, they do not show uh, the will to actually restore constitutional order in the shortest possible time in the country, the heads of state are saying constitutional order must be restored immediately. That is our beginning gambit. Okay, so for them telling us uh, they need three years, uh, on what basis did they come to that figure? On what basis? Mm -hmm. You know, the, yeah, arbitrary, you know, just uh, it's a provocation. If you want to uh, ask me clearly, it is that, uh, listen, do whatever you want. This is us, we are going to do what we want. And ECOWAS is telling them that they can never do anything that they want because Niger is signatory to ECOA protocols and those protocols must be enforced. Would you agree that ECOWAS is paying the price for ignoring that saying, a stitch in time saves nine? People have argued that you have looked at the other countries where this coup has happened and it's just been mere talk. And that's the reason why the junta in Niger has been empowered. Do you agree, agree with them? I would agree with you. Uh, but you see, uh, okay, over the past three years or so, we've seen a spate of coups in the country. And uh, probably the attitude of Ecuador toward them have not been the best, right? But there comes a time when you have to draw a line in the sand. Because mistakes were made in the past doesn't mean that you should allow the contagion, you know, to go on, particularly now 
that uh, one equals at the level of the commission as a new administration and at the level of the authority of heads of state we have a new chair who have all committed themselves to reversing the, the rot you know in the region one on terrorism you see until this coup which is actually a diversionary uh, matter for ECOWAS. ECOWAS was on uh, was on the cusp of uh, activating the standby force to go and help member states fight terrorism. A kinetic force. Everything we were already planning the meeting of uh, the defense ministers and the finance ministers to agree on concrete ways of mobilizing over 2.4 billion for the first year to for the kinetic force against terrorism whether it is in uh, Burkina Faso or elsewhere besides ECOWAS has supported this country by providing money for them to get equipment in order to fight terrorism so that was where the focus of ECOWAS was because without a peaceful environment forget about economic development you know today that uh, Burkina Faso is about 60 to 70 percent occupied by terrorists. What kind of development can take place there? You know, so this, this was what we were doing. So uh, this coup has actually thrown us, of course, diverted attention, and we want to come back to the, uh, what is our focus uh, intervention against yeah. terrorism in the region. And we, that we, is it. We understand that uh, some ECOWAS leaders are not fully in support of this coup. Is ECOWAS united on this? Uh, I, uh, well, that is news to me uh, about ECOWAS. When you are talking about some ECOWAS members, those that have openly demonstrated support for what is happening are those under sanctions. I'm talking of Mali, talking of Burkina Faso, and to some of the extent Guinea. But the rest, in Accra, all the member states, with the exception of uh, Cabo Verde, yeah, all made concrete, uh, what is it, commitments. Accra inclusive. Uh, yes. All, all the member states. So uh, there is a lot of fake news out there. You, you know, so uh, it is very important that uh, we concentrate on the official versions of the story from the Equa Commission itself. I was at that meeting in Accra, and all the member states that were there, apart from the four uh, which are under military rule and Cabo Verde, all 10 member states made concrete commitments in terms of material, in terms of uh, uh, financial resources towards a potential deployment of the equal standby force. So that is the reality. Ayo. Thank you, uh, Chamberlain. Well, that's one of the questions that naturally comes, I mean, also taking perhaps from what uh, issues Mark were raised with you earlier, would you say there is a significant decision, a significant decision within uh, Niger, among Nigerians, that's uh, concerning this particular issue, given the reactions uh, within the country uh, when the military intervened? How significant do you think that is for or against democracy in the country? Yes. <laughs> uh, look, uh, the reaction of people in uh, Niger is not against democracy. Uh, Afrobarometer uh, opinion polls across West Africa uh, returned an overwhelming support by the population of West Africa for democracy at the least uh, unpleasant, what is it, uh, system of governance for the region. So that matter is more or less settled. You can talk about governance deficits and insecurity that actually determine people's attitudes. That is number two. Number three, uh, as long as I have lived, uh, you know, in West Africa, I have never seen a coup that has not uh, enjoyed spontaneous support by the people right from the 1960s. This support can be engineered, you can rent crowds and others. That does not detract from the fact that people are genuinely concerned about their future, 
The high level of unemployment among the youth is a factor, and uh, mismanagement of our resources is a factor. But uh, are the military any better, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, governors of our economy? Uh, empirical data in the region never demonstrate that. You see, so this is the question that we have to. Is that the, is that the right way, you know, to go about trying to change, uh, the, you know, the system? Uh, a, a few years ago, if I may, you know, uh, come in, they, uh, you could not even talk of an incumbent government, incumbent president being defeated in elections. In the past uh, year, since about 1992, we have seen alternation of power where certain presidents have been defeated, where ruling parties have been defeated, whether you are talking about Ghana, you are talking about Senegal, you are talking about Nigeria, uh, uh, you are talking about Sierra Leone, you are talking about Liberia. Well, Ambassador, you know, th those issues oh, this are This is quite... happening. Yes, I, uh, I understand Benin. that. It is already, it's already progress. Yes, but you know, the, the, I mean, you also raised the, the, the major issues, the major concerns of uh, governance and uh, dividends of democracy, as you say. Now, the challenge then now would be for the people, particularly in the country under uh, surveillance and a number of other countries that may come within the radar of ECOWAS after this one, is that returning to the status quo before the coup may not be acceptable even to the, to the, to the would that be to the coists or even to Nigerians, seeing that the situation was seemingly unacceptable to a, a, number, a significant number of the population in the first place. So what is the plan? of ECOWAS to ensure sustainable political stability in a post-crisis Niger? Because if there is no clear plan uh, agreeing to return to that state they didn't like, might not be quite acceptable. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I agree with you on that point. And uh, the, uh, let me uh, put the question the other way. What plan does the CNSP Janta led by Abdurrahman uh, Chiani, what do they have for the country? They are now embarking on a blind experiment, saying that we are going to uh, have a three-year transition. We are going to consult people. They themselves came without a plan. Now that they have overturned the democratically elected government, they are thinking about alternatives. What alternatives are there? And we have seen, you know, that where coups have occurred, we have not seen any major alternative that has bettered the lot of uh, the population that uh, the military said they had come to save, you know, in those countries. So uh, uh, that, that's what I was telling you, that uh, before this coup occurred, ECOWAS had identified the cascading terrorism, which was already moving from Burkina Faso and other to the coastal countries as an existential threat uh, to the livelihoods of West African citizens, that's number one, and an impediment to economic development. First, remove that obstacle. And then we put in place, okay, uh, a regional plan for a uh, governor, which, which are already there. There are, there are rules and engagement for uh, developing the country, the regional integration, economic integration process linked to the Africa continental free trade area, increasing intra-African trade, West African trade, all these are there. They take time to bear fruit, right? But uh, the military is not an alternative, you know, to uh, well thought out uh, technocratic governance processes in the region, you know, to deal with uh, the myriad, you know, challenges facing us in a very competitive, and a diffused global environment. You see, we are just talking about West Africa as if West Africa is an island. All these challenges that you are talking about, they are global. They are global. Even the most advanced countries, ordinary people are suffering. They have not chosen the path of overthrowing their government. You know, so why, why here? If I, if I give you the data about inflation, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, other parts of Africa, 
they are not, the situation is not better than what we are seeing in West Africa today. Ambassador, while that, you know, might be the case, you know, there are a number of issues. Some people will say that, one, you also have to look at citizen involvement. How likely do you think the voices of citizens are, to, are going to be heard if ECOWAS is going to be deploying force at all in the situation in Niger? No, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We engage, uh, look, in terms of... Uh, the modus operandi of ECOWAS when it comes to uh, re, uh, what is it, reinstating constitutional order, it starts with consultations with the, all the active forces in the country. Talking about the political parties, you are talking about uh, uh, the what is it, the labor movement, you are talking about civil society organizations, women's organizations. They all have a say in it. And at the regional level, ECOWAS is actually in the process of uh, developing what we call the Economic, uh, Social, and Cultural Council, which is the interface between broader civil society in the region and policy making at the ECOWAS level. All those plans are there, and they are all aimed at making the, what the voices of the ordinary people heard. After all, ECOWAS, the, the, the main driving uh, slogan of ECOWAS is transforming the region from an ECOWAS of states, that is, which uh, ECOWAS of state, which is, uh, uh, what is it, uh, driven by the, the, the decisions of heads of state to an ECOWAS of the peoples. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and that process is ongoing, you know, right? It takes time. You cannot just, um, you know, bring about uh, people's power you know, just uh, out of the blue. Uh, Equals has got all these plans afoot. Okay, so while the plans are there, I just want to ask you on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely do you think that Equals will, must, will deploy force? How likely is it? What is the possibility? On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest and uh, yeah. 1 being the lowest. Uh, personally, mm -hmm. personally, my wish is that uh, that scale, will, it should be at zero. What? For, for deployment. Okay. That, that is the wish well, of ECOWAS. pragmatically ECOAS. speaking, yeah. looking at the conversations yes. that okay. have been going uh, on yes. and the situation that ECOWAS has found itself, exactly. what do you think the likelihood I, is? I think given the posture of the uh, regime in Niger, I will put it as seven. Because if they continue to frustrate the non-violent you know, proposals that have been made to restore constitutional order and then giving completely unacceptable uh, timetables for return to constitutional order, they make the use of force more likely. You know, this is what I would say. Uh, but uh, let me also say that at least they have come forward to say that they have an intention to return the country to constitutional order. Equa does not agree with the time frame. So even that agreement in principle is a move forward by the junta, and we are taking them on it, and then we are going to continue our discussion to see what is the uh, optimum, the minimum, you know, that will be acceptable, and that will be uh, a decision by the authority of first of state, not so, me. All right, so in conclusion, ECOWAS is not fixated on reinstating Bazoom. <laughs> no, you are asking me a loaded question. Yeah? Oh. Uh, ECOWAS is asking for the release of President Bazoum and his reinstatement. Okay, but uh, as I said, ECOWAS has got its positions. Release Bazoum, reinstate him. Is it, does it contradict? Uh, what is it? Uh, I mean, the the demand, demand for the restoration who's, who's of constitutional going to protect order. Him? Who's going to protect him if he's reinstated? Pardon? Who's going to protect him if he's reinstated? The presidential guards were the one who staged the school. Who is going to protect yes. him if yes. he's reinstated? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, you see, uh, the taste of the pardon is in the eating. We've not even sat down, okay, to... We have got our own analysis, okay, which we are not going to disclose at this forum. We, are, we have not even had a face-to-face -face discussion 
with the junta on the transition. These are opening, uh, what is it, uh, engagements that uh, we've had so far with the, with the visit of uh, the you know, former head of state, Abdul Salam Abu Bakar, general. So uh, when we sit down to talk, then we look at the practicalities of reinstating Bazoum. Is it possible? Is it feasible? All those questions, I cannot a priori answer them. You know, so like we said, everything is on the table. Nothing is off the table. But it needs, we require two, their Sorry. side and our side, to make sure that we make progress. And we are calling upon them to be reasonable, the janta to be reasonable, and that, uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, three-year transition that they are talking about is nothing, you know, less than uh, provocation, you know, to the community. <clears throat> All right, Ambassador Abdel Fattah Musa is the ECOWAS Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security. He's also a former director, he was former director for West Africa and the Sahel in UN headquarters in New York. Thank you for coming on. And we wish that all of this will be sorted amicably at the table. Thank yeah. you for your time. No, generally, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank all you. right, there you go. That is the show today. We thank you all for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm trembling or so. Goodbye. Oh, we apologize that we can't take your meals, even though we can see a plethora of them. Thank you so much for writing in. I'm Malpo Green Yusuf. Have a wonderful and productive week. I'm Ayo Makinde.